so thankful for the opportunity to speak your words today. I pray by your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would have your way, Lord, that you would speak your words, and Lord, that you would receive from the truth. Lord, I pray for strength in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Um, last week was pretty awesome having an opportunity to have our superintendent, John Davis, come and speak with us. I was, I was grateful. I, I really contacted him. I didn't tell you the story. I just sent him an email. I said, hey, we always talk about you coming to speak. Why don't you come speak? <laughs> and I just threw a date on the calendar, but it was really neat for me uh, to, to line up on the six month kind of anniversary and uh, for him to talk about authentic ministry. Uh, last week, if you missed that, it's on our YouTube. You may have got it on the Thursday email. Uh, but I encourage you guys all to go back and listen to it because uh, his words were, were powerful. It was full of the Spirit. Uh, and he, he, he encouraged us that authentic ministry happens when we are determined to preach the Word, the words of grace, the gospel message. And he says sometimes uh, when you preach the Word of God, um, people resist it. People, you know, mis misunderstand it. But he said continue to preach the Word of God and we will see signs and wonders. What was really amazing about that is, one, yes, we focused on God's healing power and his ability to do wonders and miracles, but he focused again on the fact that when anybody, when any unbeliever comes to Jesus for the first time, when they hear the words of God and say, yes, I want to follow Jesus, that's a miracle. That's a sign to wonder. That's something to celebrate. And so as he was speaking, I was just like, yes. That's exactly what we're praying for. If you guys come to any of uh, any of the Saturday night prayer meetings that we have, the number one thing on the list is always we're praying that people will come to know Jesus and people will be baptized. And so you may have um, 
scene and the Thursday emails. If you are not part of the church's Thursday emails, I want to encourage you to sign up, let me know, get, get, the, uh, get your email address to me, I'll add you to that, um, because over the next three weeks I'll be talking about water baptism and what that means and why that's significant. And if you're uh, part of Cat City Church and you haven't walked in obedience, you haven't been water baptized yet, man, I, I, will, I want to celebrate with you. The church wants to celebrate with you what God is doing in your heart. Um, so uh, that is a miracle. It's a wonder of God that people turn their hearts to Him and then decide to, to die to their old self, to say no to their own way of living and say yes to God. It's a miracle. It's a sign of wonder. So I was just encouraged by John's uh, words last week. This week, I have an opportunity. So I've already talked about money today. Uh, and now I get to talk about divorce today. Uh, so I, I was, as I was thinking about uh, doing the Sermon on the Mount, this was the sermon that I was least looking forward to, just to let you know. I took advantage of the fact that John was speaking last week because I needed extra time to study. And I was just like, all right, let me just really, I really want to study. I really want to be true to the Word of God. I want to, I want to talk about what he, he, what his heart intentions were, what his message is for us as a, as a church. And, and I want to encourage you again, every word of God, everything that he speaks, it's always useful. It's always encouraging. It always builds up. And even when it corrects us or when it brings conviction to us, it's a good thing. And we can say, yes, Lord. So I want to encourage you guys again, hey, let's receive God's words. Let's say yes to his conviction. Say no to shame. Say no to common, the condemnation. And, I, and, and going into this uh, passage of scripture, I knew that I could not, uh, I, I could not speak all of it in one message. And so this is going to be a, a four-part uh, series. Starting today, we're going to speak on Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about hope for the Christian uh, who is divorced and hope for remarriage. We're also going to be talking about, in uh, the third week, we're going to be talking about Rachel and my uh, personal testimony of God's restoration in our marriage. And so uh, for those of you that have been looking forward to hearing Rachel speak, we'll be speaking together. Um, and that will that'll be not next week, but the following week after that. And then the last week, the fourth sermon in this series is going to be on marriage. What does a Christ-like marriage look like? And uh, so walk with me. If you hear today things that you that you haven't heard before, or you hear things today that you've heard before, I want you to encourage uh, encourage you to receive them today, the words that are from God. If this challenges you and you say, hey, Andrew, maybe you didn't study that one very well, I want you to encourage, encourage you to come and meet with me. This is not going to be a time, uh, this, is going, this is going to be a time that I'm going to maybe break some norms that we've had uh, in church culture, and I, I believe that it's going to be in line with Jesus and God's redemptive plan. For, for humanity and for life. He is a God that brings restoration. He's a God that brings hope. He's a God that brings healing. And so I believe as I interpreted the scriptures that I, I was faithful to who God is and what he's doing. But I want to encourage you that this not be a time to cause uh, division, not to be a time to withhold uh, tradition, but that we truly receive from God and if there's things that I say, and this is me as your pastor being honest, if there's things that I say that you say, you know what, pastor, I super agree with that. Amen. I would encourage you to say amen. And if there's things that, that you hear and you're like, I'm not sure about that, pastor, I want to encourage you. This is what we do with offense. We learn this in scripture. You go to that person and that person alone, first and foremost. And then, you know, if you're like, hey, pastor, you're still wrong. And you need to get other people involved. I encourage you to do that. But I want to encourage us as a church to take this time to receive from God His words. And again, His words always bring hope. His words always bring restoration. His words always bring healing. So with that, I want to uh, speak today about Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be looking in verse 31 today primarily. And we'll be uh, looking at some other sources, uh, other scriptures as well. 
Uh, as I was reading uh, this chapter again, and these, these two verses in Matthew chapter 5, as I was searching through scripture, I, I was uh, reminded of a show that I have watched just a couple of times, because um, anybody, anybody, you, you watch, uh, like, videos or things like that, uh, the fail videos especially, and it's like, it like makes you laugh, or it, like even though it's cringy, that they're like really messing up royally, uh, it's still kind of funny and a comic relief. That just is me. Anyway, when, when I watch the fail videos, and I'm, I, it's like cringeworthy to see them like ride a bike backwards down steps and think that they're going to make it, and when they crash, I'm just spring me through pretty good joy. I don't know. It's, it's something I enjoy watching every once in a while. Um, one of those, one of those things that I've seen a few times. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a show on TV on, on TLC. I've seen it a few times, um, and, and it's called like Wife Swap. Have you guys seen those? And almost every one of them. I'm like, ooh, ooh, ooh. I gotta keep on watching though. It's like, ah, ooh. But what happens in the show? If you're not sure, if you're not familiar with the purpose of the show, basically, it's two families. Usually they, they have like super opposite um, standards of living um, and they, they switch, the, the wife will go and live with the other. So for the first three days or first few days of the, of the filming, they have to abide by the, the rules of the home. You know, like they have to, whatever meal time, whatever standard discipline is in the house, they have to put up with it. And it's, it's almost always hilarious. Um, no, I don't binge watch this, but I do watch, uh, have watched a few episodes. All right, so it's just, it's hard. It's really difficult for them. And then, so then the second half of the episode is usually they get to establish their own rules, right? So they, they go ahead and they, like, if, if one family, you know, they, they'll switch, like, somebody that likes to eat a lot of junk food or whatever, they'll switch it with, like, an all-organic family, right? Even if they don't have candy, their kids have never tasted sugar, you know, and all of a sudden the mom comes in, she hates the rules, she's like, we're going to go have shakes, and you guys, I want to put candy uh, candy bowls on all of the tables, right? It's hilarious. It's really funny. If you need some comic relief, you don't know what to watch, football's not on, you do not have a good book, just need a good laugh, YouTube it. Wife swap. As I looked at the scripture, Matthew chapter 5, and Jesus is beginning to, to speak these words about divorce. He is speaking specifically into a culture that was wife swapping, was spouse swapping, was divorcing and remarrying in a, in a way that, that uh, was overtaking the culture. But specifically, what Jesus is, uh, begins to address here is the wife swapping that was backed by the law. Remember, throughout the, ser the, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, again, is getting to religious leaders or religious followers who are really good at obeying the law. They were really good at getting to the point. When we talked about adultery last week, the, the religious leaders could have said, yeah, I've never slept with anybody inappropriately, I've never been naked, I've never touched, I've never gone that far with, with somebody. And so, you know, Jesus says, of course, I've, I've fulfilled the law, I've never committed adultery. But then Jesus takes that a step further, and right, remember as we said, he says, no, it's not the physical act of these things that has caused you to commit adultery. It's actually the adultery in your heart. When you have lusted after something in your heart, you have already committed the sin. And Jesus, over and over again, throughout the Sermon on the Mount, takes something that is, that is a standard, and then he says, no, there's something beyond the standard that's going on. It's a heart issue that's happening. And, and, and so Jesus speaks specifically to that heart issue. Jesus is taking the law or the standard of the time and radically deepening it and the meaning behind the law, the heart issue behind the law, the motives behind following what it was. So it wasn't just good enough for the, for the um, religious leaders to say, hey, I haven't committed adultery. No, it was a heart issue. And here now in Matthew chapter 5, verse 31, we're going to read about the divorce. And, and divorce, again, Jesus is saying, is not just about the laws and what the law said about divorce. There is a deeper heart issue that's going on that Jesus wants to correct in, in, these, in this culture and towards specifically the religious leaders. This is my encouragement 
today and as we continue to go through the Sermon on the Mount is that we will search our heart and find wherever error rests in us and rid ourselves of anything and everything that doesn't look like Jesus. And that's exactly what Jesus is uh, getting at when he speaks on this topic of divorce in Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 and 32. He is speaking to the heart of a, of a culture, of a religious culture, that has been okay with following the letter of the law, but not the heart behind it. So let's read here, Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 through 32. It says this, It was also said, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. The problem that Jesus begins to speak towards is the interpretation of whoever divorces his wife, let him give a certificate of divorce. We can look together in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. This is, where, this is where the law was given, and specifically to mandate, or sorry, to, to regulate divorce of the land. Next week, as I, talked, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about uh, the hope for the divorce, or the, or the hope for, the, for remarriage, and we're going to get into Jesus' other words, and later in Matthew, also in Mark, and we're going to look at Paul's words in 1 Corinthians, but here today we're focusing on Matthew chapter 5, 31 and 32, so we're going to look at what are these original words that Jesus was speaking against? What was the law that the, that the religious leaders were getting wrong? And so Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1, it says this, When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house. And it goes on to talk about how, uh, how that divorce should be acted out. If there is remarriage, um, can she get then be remarried back to the original, uh, original spouse? Well, the religious leaders, again, they were super good at memorizing the law, applying the law, and specifically, as we've been talking, using the law for their own advantage. Hey, I, I haven't committed adultery with that person because I've never slept with them, but though in their heart there was still all of these adulterous thoughts. And so from this uh, one, uh, one uh, law or one command about divorce and, and that, hey, the man, if he finds anything indecent or if, he, if, they, if they fail, if the wife fails to find favor in his eye, then there is able to be a certificate of divorce that is given. Well, there's two schools of thought in the re religious leaders, um, at least two schools of thought in the religious leaders about how to apply this command. And this is where we get to see this uh, wife swapping culture, this spouse swapping culture kind of beginning. And the two schools of thought is this. One was that if they were found unfaithful, specifically uh, relating to their sexual indecencies or their purity. So if a spouse, we're talking about divorce here in Deuteronomy chapter 24, if the spouse was found unfaithful, there was grounds for a sexually unfaithful, there was grounds for a certificate of divorce. The other school of thought that happened uh, focused on the fact of if they were indecent, and they focused on indecent in anything. So they were saying, hey, if my wife cannot provide a good enough meal for me, or a meal that I, uh, I can enjoy and that is cooked well for me, uh, she's been found indecent in my eyes, and I can divorce her. I know, there's a few there's snickers in the room. I mean, we can already see these guys, you know, they, they had their own agenda. Or, it says, it says specifically that they were, they could, if the wife or the spouse found no favor in her eye, they said, hey, if there's another um, woman in 
the community that is better looking than my wife, my wife has failed to find favor in my eye, and it's her fault, and therefore I can supply a certificate of divorce. We're all snickering. You guys, I don't want to get at this, right? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And we're like, all right, we can find the, the foolishness in this. When I was reading and searching it out, I was like, that really sounds foolish. Like, I've had a hard week. I'm trying, I'm trying not to say things. This morning. I'm I'm a parent now, and man, I'm learning about the slyness of ways that people try to get their they, 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 they're obedient to the law, but just their heart isn't in it. You can see how Jesus begins to address divorce here, bringing up this. Uh, this command from Deuteronomy chapter 24 is beginning to cut at these religious leaders' hearts, at these people that thought they were being faithful to the law, and the law gives me permission to do this, so hey, I'm divorcing you, and guess what? I'm going to find me that better person that's going to meet my needs. One of the things that we're, gonna, uh, we're going to be addressing as we go through this uh, series uh, about marriage is that we're going to be addressing the fact that as husband and wife, if we strive to meet each other's needs, we will always fail. What, Andrew? Brandon? I cannot meet Rachel's needs, and Rachel herself cannot meet my needs. God the Father in heaven has everything we need. Amen. Has everything we need for, as we talked about just three weeks ago, for complete satisfaction, right? Jesus is the only thing that can satisfy me. And sometimes the difficulty in our marriages will... Getting ahead, that's all right. And, and sometimes the difficulty in our marriages is that we're trying to get our needs met by our spouse, and, and, and they were not meant to meet some of the deepest needs that we have. It's actually meant to be met by God, and then the love that we have for one another is just an outflow of our needs being met by the one that can truly satisfy us. And so here in the, in the scripture again, we have these individuals that are twisting scripture because, hey, their needs, they were being satisfied, and so they were finding ways in the law to be able to permit themselves to break off their marriage because, hey, God grants me the permission to do so, so that they can go find their needs met somewhere else. This wasn't what the law was intended to do. attitude of what I can get away with instead of how can I avoid this sin. And I want to encourage us, whether it's this specific thing, dealing with marriage and divorce, or whether it's in our everyday life and we're learning the, the laws and the commands of God, the, the attitude of our heart is not how much can we get away with before grace can take over. No, it's how close can I get to God? How much more can I love Him with all of my heart, with all of my strength, and with all of my soul? Paul addresses this later in the New Testament, right? He says, if grace abounds, uh, uh, should, should we keep on sinning? Should we keep on going in our own way? Should we keep on trying to short the laws of God? He says, no way! No, we should run towards Him. We, would, we should receive from Him. In the middle of this passage, uh, there's also a, a uh, sorry, in the middle of Matthew, there's also a story uh, relating to this exact thing happening. This isn't exactly in a religious leader, but Jesus, uh, sorry, John the Baptist actually loses his life speaking against this exact wife swapping, finding my needs met in somebody else kind of thing. And Jesus, uh, sorry, John the Baptist speaks against, in Matthew chapter 14, he speaks against Philip, whose wife, Herodias, had been divorced and remarried, and there are all these different uh, situations going on, and found himself in jail, and actually lost his life in part due to him speaking against them divorcing just to remarry to get their needs met. 
Oh. Religious leaders at the time was saying, oh, she's indecent. Now I can be free to go marry another person. If you are looking, this is my encouragement to you as, as married couples in the room. If you're looking for a reason to divorce, I would encourage you to put your hope in Jesus and stop searching. But what if there's been unfaithfulness in my in my marriage? What if what if the, the my spouse is out doing their own thing and sleeping around and, and being unfaithful? I would say even in those situations, God is a God that restores and makes relationships new. Divorce may be, I'll get my opinion more on that next week, may be an option for the believer who has a spouse that is choosing to be unfaithful, specifically in their sexual relations. However, God first would say, my desire for you is restoration, redemption, and wholeness. And so if you're looking for a way, if you're trying to figure out, just like the, the, uh, the religious leaders of the day were, were trying to figure out a way, hey, the law gives me this permission, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for it, because it's going to create freedom for me, I want to be able to get my needs met better somewhere elsewhere, it's going to be better for my life if I do this. If, if any of those reasonings are something that you're thinking about and trying to find and searching for, I would encourage you today to stop and to come to Jesus because he has hope for you, he has restoration for you, he has love for you, he has wholeness for you. So Jesus continues, so that was verse 31. Verse 32, Jesus continues now to redefine or rightly define the words of Scripture. So in verse 32, it says, Anyone that divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. Sexual immorality. As I looked at the uh, scripture, this was something that um, uh, something that I, I looked at, and I, I've seen this in other uh, people's lives. I, I have dear friends that when when we were in Bible college, there was many of my friends that got married just like I did, and just like Rachel and I. Right after, you know, we met each other freshman year. It's, it's a funny thing, an interesting stat about um, Bible college marriages. So you go to Bible college, and for the first time in, in your life, whether you're a girl or boy, you meet somebody else that is just as passionate about Jesus and wants to give up all their life for ministry. So there's like uh, jokes uh, on Bible colleges that it's like ring by spring or your money back. Uh, people make that joke all, all the time. <laughs> Rachel and I, we waited about three more months. So it was actually the middle of summer after, after our freshman year that I proposed to Rachel. Uh, but this was common out of Bible college. There was many people getting married right away as freshmen, uh, in between freshman and sophomore year. 18, 19 years old, saying, all right, let's get married forever. And you can uh, imagine, as 18, 19 years old, uh, or 20 years old, uh, thinking we know everything in the world about life, getting married, uh, there was lots of things that would happen in marriages. Rachel and I are brave enough, in 30 weeks or two weeks, we'll be sharing a whole bunch of stuff with, with you. But I would find people, when I think about these words, about the, the sexual, uh, sexual misconduct, sexual immorality, uh, some of my friends would look for in, in, in their marriage, they, would, they, they couldn't wait for this one thing to happen, because then they would be off the hook. Jesus, the, the words... And again, I'm not a Greek or Hebrew scholar. I'm not like into a whole bunch of word studies. Um, but sometimes it, it is helpful when we're looking at Scripture to, to, to look a little bit about the original word and see, see what's going on here. And, and it's really to, uh, the, the words that are used about this um, sexual immorality here in verse 32 is specifically talking more about, instead of an incident, talking about a pattern of sexual misconduct. 
But again, I think about my friends who, who would tell me about this. Hey, I'm just, I can't. If, if, if they would just do this, man, I could finally just break free from these situations. I would finally be able to have my freedom. I would say this, that sexual immorality is not an automatic divorce. This is not what Jesus is promoting. He isn't promoting, oh, just because your spouse is sexual, is sexually immoral, they cheated on you, they, they went somewhere else, that is not an automatic, that's not what Jesus is promoting by saying these words, uh, you know, you can, you can, sorry, that everyone who divorces a wife, except on the grounds of immorality, makes her commit adultery, it, it is not an automatic, it's, it's not Jesus like saying, hey, go ahead, do it. Because we, we have to remember the nature and the character of who God is, right? The, what trumps all these things is who God is, that He is a God that restores, that He's a God that makes new, that He's a God that, that is, one, always faithful to us. Right? So now over 2,000 years, Jesus died, He rose again, He conquered the grave, He now sits at the, uh, at, the, at the right hand of the Father, right, waiting for that final union between the church and himself, and guess what? He's still faithful to us. Every time we mess up, every time we, we sin, every time we break up command, he's still been faithful to us over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, and shows grace, and it abounds, and it is full toward each one of us. And so, knowing that that is who God is, I, I can't I can't think that Jesus is saying here that, man, if there's, if there's a breaking of a covenant, automatic, you're okay. No, Jesus restores. And with Jesus' next word, he continues to address this spouse-swapping cultural norm. Whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, reflecting off the original words. And this is where the, the, the study I was just... I was racking my brain and trying to write this well and, and think about this well. In the context where there was religious leaders that said, hey, it's okay for a divorce to happen, especially on sexual immor immorality. Specifically here, we're going to stop just, just a moment on genders because that's, that's the thing. Um, I'm still trying to wrap my brain around all that God implies on genders and why was things written to one and not the other and, and, and where this all goes. And, and so I, I'm still wrapping my mind around it and learning how I can best speak towards that, uh, that specific way that it was written. However, if we look at Deuteronomy chapter 24, it was specifically written in such a way that the woman was unfaithful to the man. She had broken the covenant with the man. And, and so then the husband at the time was able to give a certificate of divorce and send her on her way. So if we look here now in Matthew chapter 5, verse 32, where Jesus says to them, whoever now marries the woman who has been given the certificate of divorce is uh, is unfaithful, is committing, or specifically, is committing adultery, verse 32, right? Why is this? Like, why is that specifically worded in, in, in that way? How is the one that marries the, the one that has been divorced committing adultery? As I was looking at this, Jesus speaks specifically to the heart. And specifically to this uh, culture that has been created, hey, I can divorce this person, I can go after this. Here, in Jesus' words, as I've been reading and I've been studying, I am convinced that Jesus is specifically talking about a woman who has been unfaithful to her current husband, and then now takes another husband that she's been unfaithful with. Continues to commit adultery. So, if you're thinking about this, the divorce now... When a divorce is given, it cuts the legal tie of marriage. So in that, in a twisted mindset, if I've been given that, if that 
if that has legally ended by marriage, hey, now I can remarry and, and this guy that I've been unfaithful with, and so now I can remarry, and now this new marriage is now whole and is now blessed because, hey, I, my other marriage has been cut off, so it's okay for me to continue in this wrong relationship that I started when I was married. And Jesus speaks to this. No, just because you have legal, just because one marriage has legally been broken, no, now it's not okay for you to continue in this sexual relationship with this new man or this man that you've been uh, you, you've been unfaithful with, and so now it's now blessed, and now the marriage is now whole. Again, Jesus speaking to you. No, the breaking of your relationship, your, be your beginning oath, does not free you now to live unfaithful in your new oath. Jesus speaking to the spouse swapping culture, the law gives no room for this behavior. It still amounts to adultery to divorce a spouse for another. In the context here, in Matthew chapter 5, from Deuteronomy chapter 24, the way the religious leaders would, would allow themselves to be divorced so that they could get their needs met. And in the backdrop of John the Baptist being beheaded for speaking against the very same thing, that a divorced woman would go after, a man would go after a divorced woman because there had been uh, sexual immorality between the two. He says, no. It still amounts to adultery when the divorce has been broken. You're not now just free to go and relate yourself with the one that you've been committing adultery with. As we continue, I know we're going to be talking about hope for remarriage. We're going to be looking at the, what the words of divorce and remarriage and all the other scriptures that Paul brings in to our attention. We're going to be talking about the hope for restoration. That God is a God that restores. He makes things whole. He makes things new. We're also going to be talking about God's intent and for marriage. That Jesus intends for us to have marriage that is one woman and one man forever. A covenant that is unbreakable. A covenant that is forever. Because it, again, it represents who he is. When I think about Jesus' words here again, I'm going to read them. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife, except on the ground of sex immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And these words, again, I was reading through the Sermon on the Mount, and I said, man, so here's some, some heavy words, some, some straightforward words. Jesus, again, in his passage, in this passage, speaks specifically to the heart of the individual. That would say, it's okay to get divorced, and I can, I can back it up by the law. And he would give these instructions today, again, that whoever, that speaking specifically to this culture, this habit of ours, to say, hey, how can I get out of this situation? How can I get my needs met? Hey, my needs aren't being met, so I'm going to look other places to get it met. I'm going to do the, what I think I can do legally so that I can go on and do my own thing. And Jesus responds to us this morning and says, no, it's still not all right. What's first and foremost on, on God's mind is his commitment to us, his faithfulness to us, his never failing love, his commitment to bring us restoration, his commitment to bring us hope. And so in our marriages, what we'll, we'll be studying over the thing, in our marriages, we must, we must uh, continue to exemplify that character. Now I know in a, in a room like today, uh, I was thinking about the different people that have been affected by divorce. I was thinking about people that have been divorced. I've been thinking about even when raised in a, in a divorce, in a, in a marriage where, where the marriage was broken. I, I was thinking about uh, marriages that maybe are considering uh, divorce and, and, they're, and they're fearful and they're, and they're searching and they, and they don't know and maybe they don't have hope. And, and I, I know that God's words will bring restoration to us. 
if we continue to be faithful to Him. The challenge this morning, and you're like, oh, maybe I'm single, maybe I'm not even married, maybe I'm past this, or I'm at a different phase of life, or whatever the case may be, whatever the excuses the enemy is giving, Jesus' words to us this morning are specifically uh, to see how close, I, I wrote this in my life, right? To see how close we can get to God, not to see what exceptions we can find in Him. This is the sin, if I, could, if I could point to the sin of the religious leaders of the time, their, their sin was they were trying to make the law work for their own selfish desires. And Jesus combats this all of a sudden and says, no, it, it's not okay. Your selfish desires is not permitted underneath the law. No, you can't just divorce and remarry. No, if you, if you found your wife, uh, the only way that... that Sorry, protection. The only way that you can divorce your spouse is, is for sexual um, sexual unfaithfulness. And he speaks to these things, and he says, don't try to find an exception in my, my rules. No, the rule that I have established is for faithfulness, is for hope, and for restoration. And so this morning, the opportunity that we have is to look into our hearts and say, where have I found an exception for a rule that God has given me. His holy stature that he has sent for us. Where have we tended to go towards, towards exception? Hey, how does, this, how does this sin, how does this selfish behavior fit underneath your law? And so for those of us in the room, I encourage you to examine in that way. Where have I found exceptions for my selfishness? But secondly, no doubt... Jesus is speaking specifically to those who are married, those who are thinking about breaking your marriage covenant, and saying to you, no, this is not the way of God. Divorce is not the way of God. And so this morning, if you're in this room, and you say, Andrew, I need some hope. Andrew, I would love for you to walk with me. Hey, I want you to walk with me in our marriage. I'm telling you, I am here. We get to share our story in a couple weeks. Man, I know what it's like. I said, I, I've said this before, and I'll say this in a couple weeks. Man, this one verse was the only reason why I, I, I held on to our marriage at certain points. It was like, man, I know Jesus doesn't like divorce. I'm staying here. If you're in this room and you're like, hey, I need some help. I need somebody to walk with me. I need somebody to talk with me. I need some encouragement. It, hey, I'm, I'm considering this, and, and, and I want to pray with you. I want to walk with you. Rachel, I want to walk with you so that we can see healthy marriages, marriages that look like Christ, marriages that look like hope and restoration and wholeness. This morning, this has been a moment in prayer. I want to be up here that I can pray with you and I can encourage you. But one, yes, if, you're, if you have found yourself making exceptions within God's rules for the sake of your selfish desires, I believe this morning, this time to repent and say, God, forgive me for that. And two, if you're in the room and say, you know what, my marriage is in a place and my relationship is in a place that I, I need some hope, I need some restoration, I, I need you to, to, to look more like what God wants for me, I want to encourage you to come and, and I want to pray with you. And we're going to continue to build healthy relationships in this church. Let's do this today. Let's everybody stand. I want to make it easier for us to respond. What do I mean by that? Hey, that means I, I want to encourage us to respond coming forward in prayer for a moment. Let, let me pray this morning with us. Father, I, I thank you this morning for your word. Father, I admit as I, as I studied it, I want to be faithful to it. God, I thank you for the hope that we have in you. God, a hope that our relationships can be whole, can be restored, and can be made right. Father, I pray now for these two areas that I talked about. One, if we're in this room and we're finding ways, we're finding exceptions within your law so that we can harbor our selfish desires. God, I pray that we would repent and our hearts would be made right. And Father, I pray for all the married couples in the room. Father, I pray, God, that you would bring hope and restoration and wholeness into our marriage. And Father, Lord, if we're searching for reasons to be, to, 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 to be able to divorce or to be able to break off things, I pray in the name of Jesus 
God, that you would bring hope into their hope into our lives, hope into our marriages, and that we would be set free, Father, to live a whole marriage just as you designed. God, I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you're in this room and you feel a tug on your heart to respond, I